سوره المباركه الفاتحه اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين الشفيع المذنبين وخاتم النبيين نبينا وشفينا وحريب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبكي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله لاخر لحد مني لزيارتكم everybody together please السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى اولاد الحسين وعلى صحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته صلوة الله محمد وآل محمد أعظم الله أجورنا وأجوركم بمسابنا بأبا عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام On the day of Ashura A scene take place, takes place and the Imam who has now been wounded, Imam Hussein salam, alone after he had lost all his companions, he had lost all his family members. He had also buried the six month old baby and as he fights his last fight, he becomes wounded. And as he's wounded, he starts to shake on the horse. And a final blow is hit to Abu Abdullah al Hussein with an arrow. And Imam Hussein alayhi salam comes from the horse down onto the burning fields of Karbala. And now Imam is taking his last breaths when he is on the field of Karbala. It is the last moments of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. And when that happens, they see that Imam Hussein, the army of Yazid, they see that Imam Hussein is not moving. There is no movement. So Umar ibn Sa'ad says that go and find out if if uh, uh, Imam Hussein is alive or if he's dead. Go and find out. The people, the army of Yazid, I'm not reading Messiah, but the army of Yazid, they were a little bit scared. They didn't know whether they could go and see whether Imam was alive or whether he was dead. They were a little bit scared. So they came back to Umar ibn Sa'ad and they said that we can't go near him. We don't know whether he's alive or he's dead. How do we find out if he's alive or he's dead? So Umar ibn Sa'ad said that I know how to find out. Umar ibn Sa'ad said that what I want you to do is to go and start attacking the tents of Aba Abdullah al-Hussein. 
Go and attack and loot and steal and burn the tents of the women folk of Hussein. Because if he is alive, then his zeal will not allow him to be able to see us going towards his tent. And if he is dead, then we are going to go and loot the tents in any case. So go towards the tents. So the army of Yazid started to attack the tents of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. As they went towards the tents of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, Imam alayhi salam looked and he found out that they were going towards the tents. And with his full force, and with difficulty, the Imam raises himself with the help of his elbows. He moves and he raises himself with, his, with the help of his elbows and he echoes a statement in the burning fields of Karbala. And the statement is an amazing statement, which is what we're going to analyze today. Because this is the statement during the last breaths of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. He is with full courage and with his zeal, he gets up on his elbows and he says to the people, In lam yakun lakum dinukum, wala takhafuna fil akhira, fakunu aharan fi dunyakum. Ahu Akbar. What a statement he makes. He says to the people, if you don't have the religion of Islam and you do not fear the day of judgment, at least be free in this world. At least be free in this world. In lam yakun lakum dinukum wala takhafuna fil akhira fakunu ahraran fi dunyakum. If you do not have the religion of Islam with you, and you do not fear the day of judgment, فَكُونُوا أَحْرَارًا فِي دُنْيَاكُمْ At least be free in this world. At least be free from your animalistic desires. Be free from the malice and the vices and the passions that you have. This, my friends, was a message to the humanity. This is the message of humanity of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. And this statement, it shocked the group. Eh? If you read the maktal, you'll see it shocked the group. The army of Yazid, they started to come back towards their own tents and they started to talk to each other and they said, did you see, did you hear what he said? Did you hear what Hussein ibn Ali said? What an amazing statement he made. Now here, Imam has identified three categories of people, right? In lam yakun lakum dinukum, wala takhafuna fil akhira, fakunu ahraran fi dunyakum. So there is a group of people who are on the religion of Islam and who fear the day of judgment, right? That's one group. But the one he's addressing is saying, in lam yakun lakum dinukum, wala takhafuna fil akhira. He's saying, if you do not have the religion of Islam and you do not fear, the day of judgment. So the second category of people that he's addressing are those people where he's saying you do not have the religion of Islam and you do not fear the day of judgment. That's the second category. If you do not do that, at least be free in this world. That's the third category of people. <coughs> that if you are not on the religion of Islam and you do not fear the day of Akhira, the day of Qiyamah, at least be free in this world. Now I can ask Imam Hussein Islam that you are addressing the Muslims here, man. You're addressing the Muslims when you say in Lam Yakun Lakum Dinukum Wala Takhafun al Akhira, when you're saying to the people, if you are not on the religion of Islam and you do not have fear of the day of judgment then at least be free. But ya Abba Abdullah, these are Muslims. Why are you telling them if you do not have 
the religion of Islam, and you do not fear the day of judgment. These were the people who prayed. They did their salat before the battle. <laughs> and they did their salat after the battle. These were the people who used to fast in the holy month of Ramadan. And the history says that they had big marks of sujood on their forehead. And they were the kari of Quran. They did, not know on, they did not only read the Quran, they had memorized the Quran, many of them. They knew the Quran by heart. So we can say to Imam, these are Muslims. These are Muslims, why are you addressing them that if you do not have the religion of Islam and you do not fear the day of judgment, at least be free from this, uh, in this world. Imam is alluding to the fact that the definition of religion is sometimes not how we define religion. This is the message of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Because he is addressing the Muslims. He is saying that religion is not sometimes how we define religion. A religion that is embedded in just rituals without understanding. He is alluding to something much, much higher. And my friends, this is the purpose of Muharram. His definition of religion is very different from sometimes the way we define religion. If we have defined religion only as carrying out rituals without understanding, then we are in the same group that Imam is addressing. The question we have to ask is, are we going to practice a religion based on rituals that the forces of Yazid were doing, or are we going to practice a religion that Aba Abdullah al Hussein is pointing towards? That's the question. I tell you something, and I tell you this with confidence. The purpose and goal of Muharram the purpose and goal of Muharram is not to cry on Imam Hussein. The purpose and goal of Muharram is not to lament on Imam Hussein. The purpose and goal of Muharram is not to do matam. The purpose and goal of Muharram is to transform yourself in a way that you become a better person than you were before Muharram started. That is the purpose and goal. The crying on Imam Hussein, the matam that we do on Imam Hussein, the lamentations that we do on Imam Hussein, these are the means to achieve the goal. They are not the goal. They are the means to achieve the goal. You cry, <coughs> you lament, you do matam so that you may be able to transform yourself. And you become a better person. That, my friends, is azar. That is the definition of azar. And he is saying that the first stage of this is to be free. Be a human being first. That is why Imam Hussein is for humanity. He is not for Shias. He is not for Muslims. He is for humanity because he says, "In lam yakun lakum dinukum, wala takhafuna fil akhira, fakunu ahraaran fi dunya kum." Be at least free in this world. This is the very basic that has been expected of you. When you have reached a human level, then you will be able to progress to a spiritual level. What he is saying is that if you want to achieve spirituality, you must first achieve a basic level of morality and ethics. You must achieve first a basic level of morality and ethics, and only then will you be able to progress to a higher level of spirituality. If you don't have the basic levels of morality and ethics, then we cannot achieve higher levels of spirituality according to Abba Abdullah al Hussein. And this is what he is pointing to. And we have to reflect on it. 
Do we continue on a superfluous or superficial level where we use this great sacrifice just at a superficial level? Or do we use this sacrifice to unveil the deeper, more exalted levels of spirituality? Think about it, my friends. Think about it. On the night of Ashura, Imam Hussein alayhi salam has a conversation with Umar ibn Sa'ad. A one-to-one. -one. <clears throat> when I take our groups for ziyarat, you'll remember, I specifically, a lot of groups don't go to this place because it's all in a little gully and everywhere. But I specifically take my group to this place. This is the meeting place where Imam met with Umar ibn Sa'ad on the night of Ashura, one-on-one. -on -one. And Umar ibn Sa'ad, <clears throat> you know, Umar ibn Sa'ad was not an ordinary man. Eh? Umar ibn Sa'ad at that time was known as the alim of that time. He was a faqih. The history says that when this caravan was taken from Kufa to Sham, right, it passed through a, a desert where there was a desert storm and the people came to Umar ibn Sa'ad, his army came to Umar ibn Sa'ad and they said to Umar ibn Sa'ad, we don't know where the Qibla is. We cannot figure out where the Qibla is. So we don't know which direction to pray. And Umar ibn Sa'ad looked at them and he said, look at the head of Aba Abdullah. Because the face of Aba Abdullah always will face the Kaaba. Umar ibn Sa'ad knew who Imam Hussein was. He knew the importance of Imam Hussein. And when this one-to-one -one meeting takes place on the night of Ashura, Imam Hussein asks Umar ibn Sa'ad, do you know who I am? And Umar ibn Sa'ad says, yes, I know who you are. I know that you are the grandson of the Holy Prophet. And I know how, how much importance the Holy Prophet has given you. I know that you are the prince of Jannah. I know how much importance the Holy Prophet has given you. So Imam Hussein says that if you know who I am, then why are you ready to kill me? Why are you prepared to kill me? And Umar ibn Sa'ad gives three reasons. He says, I'm ready to kill you, and I call it the three Ps. He said, I'm ready to kill you because of power, property, and possessions. He says, I'm ready to kill you because I'm going to get power. I will become the governor of Rai. Rai is that, was a large area, present-day Tehran, suburbs of Tehran. He says, I've been promised that if I kill you, I will get the governorship of Rai, and I will be given lots of properties, and I will be given lots of wealth and possessions. That is why I am prepared to kill you. And Imam Hussain alayhi salam says to him, don't worry, I'll give you more. On the day of judgment, I will give you more. Stop it. Turn back. I promise you that I will give you more. And the answer Umar ibn Sa'ad gives, he says that Ra'i is the apple of my eye. Your Jannat I have not seen yet. Umar ibn Sa'ad is completely obsessed and attached and grounded and grounded and attached to the material world, to his animalistic desires. He is grounded and attached to materialism. And that is why, even when the truth has faced him, he is not able to accept the truth. He understands the truth, he knows the truth, but he is not able to accept it. Why? Because he does not have that basic level of morality and ethics inside of him. He is too attached to the physical world. And we have to reflect, have we been like that? Are we like that? Sheikh Abbas Kummi, in Nafasul Mahmoom, he says, and I'll quote this, he says, Then when it dawned, Ibn Ziyad called for the head of Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, and ordered it to be paraded in the streets of Kufa amongst all the clans. 
a man by the name of Zaid bin Arkham, Zaid bin Arkham says that I was on my terrace when the head passed by me, placed on a lance, placed on the end of a spear. When it came close to me, I heard the head of Hussein recite the Quran, and it was reciting Surah Kahf. And you can find this in many of the maktals, original sources. The question I ask is the head of Imam Hussein alayhi salam is reciting Quran, eh? it's reciting Quran at the end of the spear. What a miracle, what a karama that the head is reciting Quran, it is reciting Surah Kaf. Why is it that after hearing the head of Imam Hussein reciting Quran, why did Shimmer not turn? Why did he not change? Why did he not regret? Why did Umar Asad not, why did it not have any effect on Umar Asad? Why did it not have effect on, uh, have any effect on Khuli? Why did it not have effect on any one of those people? Why? The reason, my friends, is that these people did not have that basic level of humanity within themselves that basic level of ethics and morality within themselves. And because they did not have that, they were not able to accept the truth. Ayatollah Mutahari, he says on his speech that he made on taqwa, he says, do not think that taqwa should always be related to religiosity like prayer and fasting and so on. Rather, he says, Taqwa is an essential part of humanity. It's an essential part of humanity. We are trying to become spiritual beings with a human experience. We need to become human beings first and try and attain a spiritual experience. And this is grounded in the Quran. Eh? In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly talks about this. And this is something we read. A lot of us know this by heart, right? Which is in Surah Baqarah, first surah, right? ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ خُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, right? ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ خُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is the book. The Quran is the book where there is no doubt in this book, but and it is a guidance for those who are muttaqin. It is a guidance for those who are pious and have committed righteous deeds. You can say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so the Quran is a guide for people who have taqwa. It's not, it's not a guidance for anybody else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا السَّوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِ مَنْ زَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنْزِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ خَطَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَعَلَىٰ سَمْئِهِمْ وَعَلَىٰ أَبْسَارِهِمْ غِشَاوَةٌ وَلَهُمْ أَزَابٌ عَظِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, Verily, those who disbelieve, it is the same to them whether you, O Muhammad, warn them or you do not warn them. It is the same to them. They will not believe. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the Quran is a guidance to those who have piety. It means that you have to have some level of piety within yourself before the Quran becomes a guidance for you. And that level of piety is basically creating a framework of Islamic morality and ethics within yourself. Because then Allah says, for those people who do not believe, and they will not believe, what will I do? I will seal their hearts. And I will, I, I, will, uh, I, will, I will put a seal on their hearts, and on their hearings, and on their eyes I will put a covering. Theirs will be a great torment. The Quran is saying, that there is a basic level of humanity that you need to achieve in order for you to have Quran as a source of guidance for you, a basic level of taqwa. If you don't have this level of freedom in your heart, then Allah even seals your heart.
ever wondered why we have listened to so many lectures, so many majalises, so many youth sessions? Huh? How many Laylatul Qadrs do we want? How many more? How many more Laylatul Qadrs do we want? Why is it, have you ever thought about it? Why is it that these things are not having an effect on us? All these lectures, I will, we invite the top lecturers, man. The most entertaining, alhamdulillah. Because now there is a tendency we want entertainment. So let's invite entertaining lectures. How many, how many online lectures have we heard? How many things have we heard? We are looking for spirituality, yet we have not developed a moral and ethical framework within ourselves to even call ourselves human. And this is the message that Imam Hussein wants to give us. In lam yakun lakum deenukum. وَلَا تَخَافُونَ الْآخِرَةِ فَكُونُوا أَحْرَارًا فِي دُنْيَاكُمْ Imam Hussein is saying that these people who were ready to kill Imam Hussein, they were not people who were leading an irreligious life or a non-religious life. No, they were people who were inhuman in their actions and their morality and their ethics. And because of that, they were ready to kill the grandson of the Holy Prophet. And the message is that when you get consumed and obsessed about your worldly desires, then it makes you an animalistic being, not a human being. And then even the Quran does not have guidance for you. Obsessed with the dunya. Now, don't get this wrong. Eh? I'm not saying that you should not have a flashy car. You know, drive a Beamer, man. I got no problem with that. Right? Drive a 7 Series Beamer. Get a nice house. That's not obsession. But I tell you, you know, obsession is something different. Right? If you, ha you all have phones, right? iPhones, Samsungs, right? Everything, right? So I tell you, give me your phone, man. I'm going to take it away from you for a couple of days. What is it going to do to you? That's the question you have to ask. How attached am I to these worldly things? How attached am I? That's the issue. This is what Imam Hussein says. Think of the night of Ashura. Think of the time when Imam Hussein alayhi salam, you see this is Arbaeen. This is the last message that I want to give to the mu'mineen. It may be harsh, but I have to make a point, right? Because this is it. This is it. We are coming towards the end of this whole season where we moan and we lament over Abu Abdullah al Hussein. We have to understand the purpose, my friends. We have to understand the purpose. Think of this time. At every moment when Imam Hussein has started his journey from Medina and he goes all the way to Karbala up till the night of Ashura, huh? Imam at every opportunity encourages people to leave him. And he says to the people, he says that leave me. Go away. I even take away my allegiance from you. I even lift my bayya from you. If you want to go, go. And many left because Imam alayhi salam started with hundreds. And he was eventually left with just a few, right? 72, 79, whatever the number is, right? But Imam at every point told them, leave. I'm even taking away my allegiance from you. Now I got to tell you, man, the people who left Imam Hussein, they could come to us and say, I left because he told us we could leave. So I didn't do anything wrong. If you look at it just from jurisprudential perspective, from an Islamic law perspective, they would say that Imam lifted his bayya from us. He told us to go, so we left. Why are you saying that we did the wrong thing? They could ask you that question, could they not? But we know in our hearts that even though Imam had allowed it, 
that they did not and they left Imam Hussein alayhi salam, we know that what they did from an ethical and spiritual perspective was not the right thing to leave the grandson of the Holy Prophet alone. It's a higher level of existence, my friends. Morality and ethics. A higher level of existence. Only then when we recite in Ziyarat Tewarisa, Wa qalbi li qalbikum selm, wa amri li amrikum muttabi. We recite in Ziyarat Tewarisa, O oh, Imam, on my, may my heart be aligned with your heart, and my deeds be aligned with your deeds. We have to ask, is my heart truly aligned with your heart? And are my actions and deeds truly aligned with your deeds, Abu Abdullah? A transformational change must occur within us to be able to justify our commitment to Abu Abdullah al Hussein. It cannot be the same as it was before we started Muharram. It cannot. It has to be different. There has to be a change. There has to be a resignation to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to be different. We have to become more ethical and more moral in our behavior. We cannot come here for 40 days and then go back and cheat and lie and do everything that we used to do before. It cannot be the same. You know, Ghazali... He talks about a pen of animals, right? So he talks about a pen of sheep and gazelles. And you see, he says, that these sheep and gazelles, they are just merrily, you know, having a good time, right? They are swagging, you know, they are just, you know, grazing on the, uh, you, know, on, you know, on the vegetation. They're just having a good time. And then all of a sudden, a lion comes and he picks up a gazelle. And he takes that gazelle with him. And when that happens, you will see that the rest of those gazelles and sheep in that pen, for five minutes, they become stunned. They stop. They're just looking at each other. Saying, what happened? They just look at each other. Because the lion has come and taken one of them away. But after those five minutes, what happens? they merrily go back to their own grazing the way they did before. Chilling and having a good time. And we have become like those pen of animals. Come to Muharram and boom, there is a shock. For a few minutes, for 30 days, 40 days, it's oh. But then when it is over, we go back to our merrily our own ways. This is what we do. We have separated the church from the state. We practice our religion, but we also want to worship the dunya. Balance. Balance. Dunya nuwe karsu, akhirat nuwe karsu. Thoru. This is the what we want. Balance. When sometimes we focus on the details so much that we miss the big picture. My friends, it's time to practice Islam for our hearts, from our hearts. And such was the case of the people of Karbala. They were obsessed in the army of Yazid in rationalizing the religion of Islam, rationalizing it and obsessed in it in such a way that they had forgotten the essence of Islam. Essence was forgotten. They were focused on details. They had forgotten the essence of Islam. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, look at this. Eh? Look at this man and how connected he is to Allah. And look at the message he gives to us. How connected is this man to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He has Ali Asghar in his hands. Eh? Ali Asghar has just been slaughtered by Hurmala. And he goes and he gives this six-month-old baby to, her, to his mother. And now look at the scene. Think about the scene. Take your hearts to Karbala for a minute. And think about that scene. Imam Hussein alayhi salam has given this six-month-old baby to his mother, Rabab. 
And Rabab is standing there with this six-month-old corpse. And Aba Abdullah takes his sword and he starts to dig a grave for Ali Asghar. But as he is digging a grave for Ali Asghar, he is saying something. And what is he saying? He is saying, Oh my Lord, a tam tu iyali likay arak. He says, Oh my Lord, I have orphaned my children so that I may come and see you. Allahu Akbar. I have orphaned my children so that I may come and see you. And then he says, If they cut me into pieces, irban irba, my heart will not long for anyone. My heart will not yearn for anyone besides you, O oh Allah. Look at the connection of Abba Abdullah. On this day of Ashura, eh, we all did Amal of Ashura, did we not? Eh? Did we do Amal of Ashura, Mukhisab? Yeah? Yes. We did Amal of Ashura, this Ashura. Eh? What did you do in the Amal? We recited the Ziyara. And then after the ziyarah, there is a point in the amal where you walk seven times in front and you come back, right? And you say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, ridhan bi kaza'ihi wa tasliman li amri. Right? You do that in your amal, don't you? Why do you do that? You do that because this was the sunnah of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, right? Because when he took Ali Asghar with him, when Ali Asghar had been slaughtered by Urmala, he could not make himself go to the tent and show the mother of Ali Asghar that his son, her son had been martyred. So he walked seven times towards the tent and he retreated seven times back. The question I ask is out of all the things that happened in Karbala, many things happened, right? In Karbala. Why this particular thing has been put in the Amal of Ashura? Why this? Imam had many difficulties. If I read to you the difficulties when he went to the, uh, you know, to the body of Ali Akbar, when he went to the body of Qasim, why this? The reason is that Imam, this is a symbolic issue. The symbolism behind this is Imam Hussein alayhi salam is taking his Ali Asghar and he is saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have orphaned my children so that I may come and see you, O Allah. The question for us is, what have we sacrificed this Muharram? Who is your Ali Asghar this Muharram? Who is your Ali Asghar? What have you sacrificed? What have I sacrificed this Muharram? If you decide this Muharram that there is one guna or one disobedience that I perform, oh Allah, I make a commitment that this Muharram, I will sacrifice that, I will not perform that disobedience again, then you have done Adha of Aba Abdullah. Or if you say to yourself, there is one obedience that you have, one wajibat that you have, I don't perform it on a regular basis, but from this Muharram, I will sacrifice and perform that, then you have done the Aza of Aba Abdullah. Then you have understood the message of Imam Hussein. Otherwise, it's a ritual. And Allah is so merciful, He will give you a reward for it. It's not that he will not give you a re reward for it. He will give you a reward for it. But is this the purpose, my friends? Is this the purpose? And that is the reflection that we have to have. This is the calling for us, the resignation to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. In Kufa, Ibn Ziyad comes to Janab Zainab, Salamullahi Alayha. And he comes to Janab Zainab, and in a very arrogant and very cruel way, see what Ibn Ziyad says to Janab Zainab. He says, What do you think about what Allah has done to your brother? Allah Akbar. He says, What do you think about what Allah has done to your brother? What is the response of Zainab? What is the response of Zainab? Zainab responds by saying, Ma ra'aytu illa jamila. 
He says, she says to Ibn Ziyad that in Karbala, I did not vision anything except beauty. I have not any, seen anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except good things, except beauty. And so the question I would ask Janab Zainab sallallahu alayha, what version of Karbala do you have? What beauty is it that you're talking about? Whereas, you know, other people are not able to comprehend this. Most of the narrators of this tragic event are in oblivion of this. I did not vision anything except beauty. Her response to Ibn Ziyad. And it shows that it is here that we come to realize that beyond this materialistic realm that we are in, there is another realm. A realm. This materialistic realm is a realm of plurality and conflict. But beyond this is a realm of unity, harmony, love, and beauty. And this is what Janab Zainab is able to see. And when you have this level of taqwa inside of you, when you have this level of morality inside of you, when you have this level of ethics inside of you, then you can have this beauty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this ability from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What Janab Zainab is saying, she was able to not only see what was happening in Karbala, in the physical realm, she was able to witness the consequences of this great sacrifice beyond that materialistic realm. She is able to see the consequences of the sacrifice at the same time that the sacrifice is taking place. And when she sees that consequences of the sacrifice in the hereafter, in the barzakh, she says, I don't see anything except beauty. This is Jainab. This is what we need to do, my friends, in our lives. Move from the superficial realm into a realm which is deeper, where we are able to witness glimpses of our lives. And it's possible. It's possible. But it is first important to create a level of humanity within ourselves. Look at the contrast eh, when this happens. Look at the contrast when this happens. You see. Um, if you look at uh, the fourth Imam, the response of the fourth Imam, Imam Sajjad sallallahu alayhi Marwan bin Hakam. Who was Marwan bin Hakam? Marwan bin Hakam was the son in law of the third Khalifa. Okay? So Marwan bin Hakam was the son in law of Osman. He was the power behind the throne. He did everything against the Ahlul Bayt. This is the same guy, right, if you remember, and a lot of Zakirin recite this, that on the first night of Muharram, they recite this, that this is the same guy that when Imam Hussein Islam was called to give allegiance to Yazid by Walid in Medina. Yeah? Remember Imam Hussein was called by Walid in Medina to give allegiance, to do bayat to Yazid. Imam Hussein went with Abu Fadl Abbas -Islam, and some of the youngsters, some of the youth of Banu Hashim. And when he went inside, this Marwan bin Hakam was sitting next to Walid. And when Walid asked Imam Hussein -Islam, to give bayat, to give allegiance to Yazid, Imam's response was, Ask me tomorrow in Masjid al-Nabawi. Ask me in public and I'll give you my response. It was at that time that this Marwan bin Hakam stood up and he said to Walid, Oh Walid, do not let Hussein go from here. Either he gives bayat to Yazid or you behead him right here. This is Marwan. Marwan bin Hakam. This is Marwan bin Hakam. He was like a bad dude, man. He really was. He was the guy behind the atrocities of the Ahlul Bayt. Now, one year after the events of Karbala and the impact of the Khutbat 
right, of the speeches of Janabe Zainab sallallahu alayha, one year after the events of Karbala, people of Medina sent a mission to investigate Yazid. They sent a mission, official mission, eh, to investigate Yazid. And in his, you know, because they had heard about this oppression and everything, you know, so they went to, they wanted to find out for themselves if this is true or not. So this mission goes to Syria. And then this mission comes back and the mission officially created a report. This mission from Medina, they created a report. And in their report, they said about Yazid that forget about him being a Khalifa, we are even questioning if he is a Muslim. Because he openly drinks, he is oppressive, and so on and so forth. So he said, forget about Yazid being a Khalifa, we are not even sure he is a Muslim. So what happened as a result of this, this created an uprising in Medina. So there was an uprising in Medina against, against the Banu Umayyah. Uprising against Medina, in Medina against the Banu Umayyah. At that time, Marwan bin Hakam was the leader of Banu Umayyah in Medina. So when there was an uprising against Banu Umayyah, Marwan felt that him and his family were not secure in Medina anymore. So they, Marwan wanted to flee Medina and go back to Syria. He wanted to go back to Sham. But he had with himself the, his wife and his children, the daughter of the third Khalifa, and the grandchildren of the third Khalifa were with him. So Marwan bin Hakam knew that you know, with his family he could not flee because you, know, you have to hide and you have to choose the right time and then you have to go really fast with children and women. He could not do that. So he started to look for security and safety so he could put his wife and his children somewhere where they could be secure and safe. And so then he could flee to Syria. So he goes to different houses. And because there is an uprising in Medina against the Banu Umayyah, everybody closes their door. They say to Marwan, man, thanks very much, man. Have a nice day. But we're not going to be part of this. He goes to Abdullah bin Umar. Abdullah bin Umar is the son of the second Khalifa. Right? He goes to Abdullah bin Umar and he says to Abdullah bin Umar, look, I have to flee. I have to go from here and I want to go back to Sham. I need you to keep my wife and children in your house for security because Abdullah bin Umar was very highly respected in Medina. And nobody would challenge him or go into his house, even if they knew that they were there. So, but Abdullah bin Umar looked at Marwan bin Hakam and he said, nothing doing, man. I'm sorry, but boom, close the door. Finally, Marwan bin Hakam with his wife and his children comes to the door of Imam Sajjad salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. And he requests security for his family. The daughter and the grandchildren of Osman come to the door for security at the house of Imam Sajjad. Do you think Imam Sajjad had forgotten who Marwan was? Do you think Imam Sajjad did not remember that Marwan was responsible for the murdering of his family in Karbala? Do you think that Imam was not aware of it? But what does the Imam do? The Imam does not even ask a question of Marwan. He does not even ask him her question. Marwan comes to the door of Imam Sajjad. Imam Sajjad opens the door and he says, I will give security to your wife and to your children. Why? Because Imam wants to teach us the level of morality and ethics. When that level of morality and ethics is ingrained in our hearts, then the response that you have is an automatic response that is directly for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was an akhlaqi slap on the face of Marwan that Imam Sajjad gave. After all these atrocities, he still gives refuge to Marwan bin Hakam. 
My friends, it is the night of Chahlum. It is the night of Arbaeen. And we have to reflect if we do nothing else. We have to ask ourselves, what is it that we are going to sacrifice? How are we going to change? How can we reflect within our own selves and see what is it that we can present to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say to Allah, oh Allah, I don't have the capacity to present what Abba Abdullah presented, but I will present my sacrifice to you. And my sacrifice may be that I'll become a better person. I will obey you more than I did before. I will refrain from your disobedience more than I did before. I will try, O oh Allah. I will try. And when you develop this morality and ethics within yourself, then see how Allah and the Quran become a guidance for you. For the calamities and the afflictions are endless, my friends. And on this night, we talk about those calamities those afflictions that was given to the caravan and the Ahl Haram of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. There comes a time because of the pressure of the khutbah, of the lectures, of the sermons of Janab Zainab sallamullahi alayha, Yazid comes and gives permission to the Ahl al-Bayt that the Ahl al-Bayt can be freed. He calls Imam al-Sajjad. When Imam al-Sajjad comes to the darbar of Yazid, he is wearing this heavy metal restraint around his neck. And this heavy metal restraint had sharp edges. It had pointed edges that were pointing inwards, not outwards. And this metal restraint was such that whenever Imam Sajjad salam would move his head, an appointed edge would pierce his neck and he would start to bleed profusely. When Imam salam comes to the darbar of Yazid, this particular restraint was put on the neck of Imam Sajjad on the 12th of Muharram. When Yazid looks at Imam Sajjad alayhi salam, <coughs> Yazid says to Imam Sajjad, Ibn al Hussein, this restraint is still around your neck. <laughs> says, This restraint is still around your neck. Imam Sajjad says, Yes, this restraint is still around the neck. Imam, uh, Yazid says to Imam Sajjad, It is time for you to go. And Imam Sajjad he, he says, I am freeing you to go. It is up to you whether you want to stay in Sham, you can stay in Sham. If you want to get go back to Medina, you can go back to Medina. Imam Sajjad comes to his aunt Zainab and he says to his aunt Zainab, Oh, my aunt, we have been freed by Yazid. Uh, tell me, what should we do? Stay in Sham or go to Medina? Janab Zainab says to Imam Sajjad, Oh my son Sajjad, we have nothing to do in Sham. We will go to Medina. But then Janab Zainab says, she says to Imam Sajjad, I want you to go and tell Yazid that Zainab has a demand. What is the demand, O oh Aunt Zainab? She says, tell Yazid that we want a house. A house where we can mourn and grieve the Shuhada of Karbala. And we want to be able to give the message to the people of Sham. A house was emptied and for three days and the women of Sham would gather in this house and Bint Zahra Zainab would mount the member and she would do the Zakri and the Azadari of Karbala. The women would wail and cry and Zainab would tell them let me tell you how the spear was struck on the chest of my Ali Yunil Akbar. Let me tell you how Hormala pierced and slaughtered the neck of my Ali Asghar. Let me tell you how my Abbas's arms were severed on the river of Furad. Let me tell you how the body of my brother Abba Abdullah Hussein was trampled by the horses on the day of Ashura.